I want to talk to you about today. The change that Jesus has made in your life is a story you need to learn to tell. And so we're going to talk today about telling your story. We're going to look at a man who met Jesus and forever changed his life. That man's name is Paul, who met him on the Damascus Road. And Paul's life changed forever. So if you have a Bible today, open it to Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25 and find verse 23. Acts chapter 25 and find verse 23. If you didn't bring a Bible with you today, there's a Bible in the pew rack and it's a hardbound black Bible. And it, if you'll open that Bible to page 934, 934, you'll find Acts chapter 25 and verse 23. When you have found that, I want us to pray together. I want you to pray for me today that I can ask the, uh, the, the, the Lord would just speak through me. Ask the Lord to say, to say His words through me today and then pray for yourself that you wouldn't allow anything that distracts you and you would listen and hear what, what He wants you to hear today. So let's take a moment. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. Certainly you pray for yourself as well. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, thank you today for the opportunity to worship you in song as we've done, to sing to you, to hear your word sung back to us and be inspired by what we heard in song today. And now, Father, we open your holy word, inspired word. I pray, Father, that you would just speak through me and to us the truths that are here. I pray that we would see from Paul's life and his example, Father, how we can tell our story as he told his before King Agrippa that day. And so, Father, speak to every person here today, regardless of where we are, where they are on their spiritual journey. Father, meet them at their point of need today. I pray you would encourage Pray that you would challenge each of us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You probably remember this exchange that occurred in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. There was a guy there who made the Pharisees mad just by looking at them. You see, he could now see. And what really made them mad was his story of how he had gained his sight. The man said, that man that you call Jesus made mud and he smoothed it over my eyes and told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash off the mud. And I went and I washed and now I see. And those unbelieving Pharisees retorted, but this man Jesus is a sinner. He's not from God. And the man who had just received his sight replied, I don't know whether he's from God or a sinner like you say, but I know this, I once was blind and now I see. I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but I do know this, I once was blind, but now I see. You see, dear family, unbelievers may want to argue doctrine with you. Jesus, from God or not from God. Unbelievers may want to argue doctrine with you. They may even deny your doctrine, but they cannot argue with your personal story. They cannot ignore the fact that your life has been cleaned up and changed by Jesus Christ. That person that you're 
witnessing to that person that you're praying for to come to know Christ may stop his ears at the presentation of a preacher like me or he may stop his ears at the pleadings of an evangelist but somehow he is attracted to your story. Someone just like him who found peace. So believe me when I say that the steps that led to your conversion and the subsequent change in your life are far more appealing to a lost man or woman than any powerful pulpit exposition of John chapter 3 on how to be born again. Your story is powerful. We need to rediscover the value of telling others you need to rediscover the value of telling others how Jesus changed your life. It is a vital link in the chain of God's plan to reach the lost of this community. So here's our life point. I, I, I tell you now before we even get into the text, here's the life point. Rediscover the power of a personal testimony. Tell your story. Paul was a man who met Jesus. As I said a minute ago, he met him one day on the Damascus Road. His encounter with Jesus literally changed the direction of his life. The persecutor of Christians became the proclaimer of Christ. He started untold number of churches as he journeyed across the known world of that day. On six separate occasions... Between Paul's third missionary journey and his final trip to Rome, Paul stood before different audiences and presented Jesus to them. Six times he stood before audiences. Six times he addressed unbelievers. And although he was a brilliant orator, Paul didn't preach. And although he was extremely knowledgeable in his grasp of the Scriptures... Paul did not argue doctrine or theology with them. Do you know what Paul did all six times? Paul shared his personal testimony. He told his story. Each time he spoke, he simply shared with those gathered how his own life had been changed by Jesus Christ. Not once did he argue, not once did he debate, not once did he even preach. Why? Because the most convincing, unanswerable argument on the earth regarding Christianity is your personal experience with Jesus Christ. Rediscover the value, rediscover the power of a personal testimony. Tell your story. So that's what I want to do today. I want to challenge you to develop your testimony. I want, to learn, I want you to learn how to present it in a way that is effective in reaching a lost man or woman. We're going to learn from Paul today. If you would, look at the back of your bulletin. Or as Shannon mentioned to you a minute ago, there is a card in the packet we have given you looks like this. The back of the card, though, is what I'm interested in. Or the back of your bulletin where there is four simple questions. One, two, three, four. Or four simple sections of developing your testimony. We're going to learn today from the Apostle Paul. Now, let me set the context for you. In Acts 25, we find Paul's speech before King Agrippa. This will be his sixth and final defense of Christianity recorded in Acts. Paul has been in custody now for over two years. He has endured five hearings and still has not been charged with a crime. Soon he will go to Rome to stand trial before Caesar, Nero. 
Yet according to Festus, the Roman ruler, he has done nothing wrong. So what should he, Festus, being the new governor of the territory, write to the emperor in Rome regarding the prisoner he is about to send to him? Dear Nero, here's Paul. He's on trial for nothing in particular. No, Festus needs help. So visiting Festus is King Agrippa and his sister Bernice. And Festus is hoping that King Agrippa would be able to sort out the issues and help him write something reasonable to Nero. So the Jewish King Agrippa sought to oblige this Roman governor Festus and the proceedings begin. Acts chapter 25, verse 23. So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice, and again, that's his sister, amid great pomp and entered the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appeal to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my Lord. Therefore I brought him before you and all, especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. Now the setting here is a large courtroom. It's simply called an auditorium in verse 23. However, the room was anything but simple. Heavy tapestries would have adorned the walls. Marble pillars would have vaulted upward to meet an ornately carved ceiling. At the far end of the room, there would have been rich, polished wood where the judges' benches stood. The doors open, and with slow, majestic steps, King Agrippa and Bernice flow into the room wearing purple robes. Verse 23 says it was amid great pomp. The Greek word means to show out. The Greek word means to put on display. The entourage entered the room with a showy parade of elegance and power. And then at the command of Festus, in stark contrast, Paul is brought in. His hands are chained, his feet are in shackles. Can you imagine that scene? What irony. Paul, free in Christ, heir to the kingdom of heaven, standing before a room of pretentious, Showy, pride-filled, lost people. Let's read on. Chapter 26, verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then all Jews know my manner of life from youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion, and now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain. 
as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered a credible, incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priest, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to the foreign cities. Now, look again at the back of your screen or the back of the bulletin or the screen. What is Paul doing in these first 11 verses? He is describing what his life was like before his relationship with Christ. And that's the first step in telling your story. Paul talks about his ways as a persecutor of the church in order to establish some common ground with Agrippa. Because you see, Agrippa hated Jesus as well. Agrippa's great-grandfather was Herod the Great, who sought to destroy Jesus as an infant. Agrippa's father was Herod Agrippa I, who had James executed and has imprisoned Peter. You can read about that in the book of Acts. Agrippa had followed in the footsteps of his father and his great-grandfather. And Paul says to him, I used to be just like you, Agrippa. I used to hate Jesus just as much as you did. Paul is identifying with Agrippa. He's building a bridge between himself and Agrippa. He is making himself real to Agrippa. So Agrippa would look at him and say, here's a man who's not much different than I am. Here's a man who once held beliefs just like I do now. Here is a man who is real and, and, and transparent. So what's the first step in building your testimony? You start with what your life was like before you met Christ, seeking common ground with the person you're talking to. Now, there are a lot of things that could be common ground. Struggles can be common ground. Describe your struggles to the man. Maybe you know he's had some of the same struggles. Your fears can be common ground. Your doubts can be common ground. Your circumstances can be common ground. Even accomplishments can be common ground. Or hobbies can be common ground. Or interests can be common ground. You need to find something that builds a bridge between your life and the life of the person you're interested in. Rediscover the power of a personal testimony. Tell your story, and it begins by you describing what your life was like before you had a relationship with Christ. Now, with that link established, Paul continues. Look at verse 12. While I was so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the... Authority and commissioner of the chief priest. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up. And stand on your feet, for this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things of which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Now, with the link established of common ground, Paul describes how he realized his need for Christ. And that's the second step in telling your testimony. How did you realize your need for faith in Christ? Notice three words in, in verses 13, 14, and 15. I saw, I heard, and I said. I saw a light from heaven. I heard a voice saying to me, I said, who are you? And then came back, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
Paul is describing that moment when Jesus stopped him on the road to Damascus and brought him to a point when he realized his need of Christ. You do the same. The second step in sharing your testimony is to describe how you realized your need for Christ. Now, be, be extremely careful here. Don't be vague. Regarding how you saw your need for Jesus, use plain language. Don't try to use theological or religious jargon. Be warm and genuine as you talk about how you realized your need for Christ. Because you see, a smile breaks down a whole lot of barriers. Just talk about how you realized you needed Christ. Now let's continue. Paul moves quickly from describing how he realized his need for Christ to describing what being saved involves. Look at verse 17 and 18. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of God to Satan that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That is, faith in Jesus. Now, those two verses are a concise, believable, coherent statement of how a person is saved. Verse 18 talks about turning from darkness to light. That means repent of your sins. It talks about going from the dominion of Satan to God. That talks about going from one master and Lord to another master and Lord of your life. Who's running your life? Used to be this person, Satan, now it's the Lord. They receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified. That's, of course, heaven. By faith in me, that's Jesus. And so, Paul is saying this. Paul is saying, I made this decision. I made the decision for Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And that's the third step for you as well. The third step is, when and how did you make a decision for Christ to be the Savior and Lord of your life? Be as specific as you can. Speak of Jesus, not the church. Refer to the decision you made. Emphasize faith more than how you felt. And try to describe as accurately and as precisely as you can what you did, or what you prayed, or what you said. Rediscover the power of a personal testimony. Tell your story. Now here's the final step. Notice what Paul does as he closes. Verse 19, So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and throughout Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ should suffer. And that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and the Gentiles. You see, Paul is saying, here is the difference that Christ has made in my life. King Agrippa, I did not ignore the light. I did not ignore the voice. I obeyed. The direction of my life changed. Jesus changed my life and he can change your life Two, that is what Paul is announcing. And so the final step in you telling your story is to describe the difference that Christ has made in your life since you placed faith in Him. Be honest as you talk. Don't promise, man, if you'll just come to Jesus, all your problems are going to be solved. That's not true. That's not true. And as you speak, put yourself in the shoes of that person you're talking to. Don't argue with them. Absolutely refuse to argue. Nobody has ever argued into the kingdom of God. You can't arm wrestle anybody into God's kingdom. Paul won them over with genuineness and warmth. 
It's okay to admit you continue to struggle. It's okay to admit you're not perfect. They know that. But the answer to those struggles and the answer to those imperfections now lives inside you. Describe for them the difference Christ has made in your life and then call them to a decision. Would you like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Is there anything that is hindering you from trusting Jesus right now? Call them to a decision. Now, let's look at the results. We just got to be real. Look at verse 24. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner... King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether, you, whether in a short time or a long time, not only you but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Now listen. Sometimes when you share with people your testimony, they're going to get irritated with you. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're a Jesus freak. They're going to think you're a lunatic. They're going to think you're one of those crazy religious nuts. You just stay confident. You just stay composed. Some of those you share with will not give you a yes right then. Be prepared for that. Verse 28 is the source of much discussion among the commentators on what Agrippa was saying, how he was saying it, and what he meant by it. It's been translated a lot of different ways. King James, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. Is it a question? Is it sarcasm? Is he jesting? Is it a burst of anger? I don't know. I'll let you think about that. Bottom line is, is he was not ready based on Paul's response. The bottom line is, regardless of whether it was sarcasm or jesting, you think you can persuade me to be a Christian in just a few minutes? Or even whether it was an honest question, Agrippa wasn't ready. Wasn't ready. I just want you to hear Paul's reply. And I want you to see his heart. And I want you to feel his compassion for the lost men and women in this room. Paul says in verse 29, I would wish to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you but all who hear me today might be like I am. Except for these chains. Do you remember what I told you at the beginning? The ornate room, the marble pillars, the rich polished wood. Remember the pomp, the showy display, the entourage parade into the room. Remember the elegance, remember the power. And there Paul stands in chains. His feet shackled together. The clink of those chains as he shuffles his feet or 
walks back and forth can be heard echoing off the walls of that room. What a contrast. Now you tell me, who is the free man in that room? And who is the slave? You tell me. But I've got a better question. Who who are the free men in this room this morning? And who are still enslaved to sin? Who are the free men and women in this room this morning? And who is still enslaved to their sin? You see, as I've talked this morning, you've either been saying to yourself, okay, I've got that, I understand that, I I need to be interesting, I need to be logical, yes, I need to be specific, yes, I need to smile, yes, I need to be genuine, And, and you've been thinking about that person that you can share your faith with, or you have realized you don't have a testimony. You don't have a testimony yet because you have not made the decision to trust Jesus yet. And I believe God brought you to this service today to be saved. Have you met Jesus? Are you free from your sin or are you still in chains? I'm going to ask you to give your life to Jesus Christ today. He will forgive you. He will save you. There was a time in my life when I was afraid. I lived in fear of a lot of things. There were, there were dogs in the neighborhood in which I lived in and sometimes I was afraid to go outside because I was afraid the dogs would, would bite me. I was afraid that that other stuff would happen to me, things I could not control. And most of all, I was was afraid to die. And one day something happened to me, and I thought I was going to die, literally. In fact, I lay on my back screaming, am I going to die, am I going to die, am I going to die? I lived in fear. Then someone explained to me that I didn't have to be afraid. Someone explained to me that I didn't have to live in fear. That Jesus would take my fear away if I would trust Him as my Savior. If I would trust Him as my Savior, they told me I would have peace and not fear. And that's what I was looking for. Peace. I realized that I was a sinner. I realized I had broken God's laws. I realized partly because because of that, it's why I lived in fear. I turned from my sin. And I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now I'm not afraid anymore. Because I know the Lord is in control of the circumstances of my life. I know the Lord is in control of my steps every day. He is walking with me and He is walking beside me. And all fear is gone. Jesus changed my life. What in your life do you wish were gone today? What is it in your life? It was fear in mine. What is it in your life that you wish were gone today? The first step to having it gone is trusting Jesus as your Savior. Would you bow your head with me? Father, I pray right now for those who in the course of this message, realized I don't have a testimony. 
I've never made a decision to trust Christ. Father, I pray that right now where they sit in their pew, Father, you, they would cry out to you, call out to you, repent of their sin, Father, and ask you to save them. And you will. You brought them here today to be saved. And so, Father, draw them to you and do the work of salvation in their life right now. I pray that in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and and your eyes closed, sir, ma'am, maybe you do. You just simply need to call out to Jesus right now. Repent of your sin and turn away and trust Christ to be your Savior and Lord. You can do that right where you sit. You can do it right now. Amen. We're going to stand in just a moment and sing. This is our custom. If you're here today and have called out to Jesus to save you, make your way out of the row there and down an aisle. Share with Shannon or myself here at the front. Or maybe you haven't done that, but you'd like to, and your coming would say to us, I, I'm, I want to call upon Christ today to save me. If you're here and you want to unite with our church, this is one of the moments, one of the ways you can join our church. Your testimony is you're already a believer, but you're coming to unite and link your life with us, these believers, this family of God in this place. We would welcome you today. Maybe you just need to come to the altar to pray, brother, sister. You see, there's a card in that packet, and on that card there's three lines. Who is it? that you're praying for to be saved? Who is it that you can go and tell your story and invite them and call them to a decision about Christ? Maybe you just need to come to the altar now and begin to pray for them or even continue to pray for them. So let's all stand and we're going to sing and I wait for you to come.